masses of hopeful Baltimore home buyers were not causing traffic jams outside local banks on this, the first day of the city's long-awaited low-interest mortgage program. <laughs> Would-be homeowners had apparently heeded the advice to simply call in for a mortgage appointment at one of the 15 lending institutions involved in the $50 million loan program. So all the action was really on the phones, with loan officers all over town by 9 a.m. overwhelmed by calls. Response was quite heavy. This morning at 8 30, when our switchboard opened, uh, telephone calls started to come in. And it was very difficult for anybody here to get an open line for at least two and a half hours. After the first four hours of business, Baltimore Federal had only 200,000 of its $1.4 million pot of cheap mortgage money left unassigned. They've already started a waiting list in case not all those loans go through. Among those rushing to call Baltimore Federal this morning were Rhonda and James Hunter, hoping that their moment of victory is near. The Hunters and their two children live in this rundown two-bedroom apartment on the west side of town. The city's new program is their ticket to a new life away from slum living. They insert in some way to a five-hour club bedroom window with no reason at all. And the glass and everything, the baby was sleeping in there, both the children sleeping in our bedroom. And glass and everything went all over the place. Glass was on top of his head, but he didn't get hurt, though. But they crazy around here, I'm telling you. Did you ever think you'd be able to afford your own house? No, I didn't. I never thought I could be able to afford a house. I barely a plot maker, I barely. But we got it, Uncle. Just glad we went our way. James Hunter is a laborer earning $15,000 a year. He never went to high school, but he's held down his job for nine years. He and Rhonda found a $17,300 house that he can afford to buy, but only at 10.86%. And that will mean freedom from an oppressive landlord. Uh, we were sitting in the cold for a long time, you know. I didn't appreciate that because uh, I was paying my rent. Buying this house is doing a great deal, like I'm really stepping out, you know. This is the house that the hunters are dreaming of. A row house in the Mondaman area in a quiet neighborhood with lots more space. The Hunter's Dream House has a big dining room and kitchen, three bedrooms, and a backyard and front porch. With a low interest $25,000 loan that includes repairs and closing costs, their house payment will be about $292 a month, or about a week's pay. It's a steep jump from $155 a month rent, but it's a bargain. They only had to put $500 down. Without the program, they'd be paying 18 and a quarter percent and about $1,000 more a year. Moderate income people pay just under 12 percent interest, but if they qualify, they too stand to save thousands over the course of 30 years. For every excited potential homeowner making a mortgage appointment today, there will be perhaps three or four disappointed people who will not get approved. The city is planning to go back to the bond market in the fall to raise another $50 million to extend the program. But that is uncertain. What is certain and so exciting is that there is $43 million in banks around the city available at bargain rates for the first time, ready to make dreams come true. I'm Fran Van Shell on the scene in Baltimore. Guardian angels tend to attract attention wherever they go. The hat, the shirt, the pants, all make them stand out, and that's exactly what they want. Two blocks away, you'll see a guardian angel patrol coming, and it's so that we can be recognized, so that people will see here's a guardian angel patrol, and if there's an incident against the law, then we're going to definitely get involved. Tony Lighty is director of the Angels East Coast Division. Today he's in Baltimore, hoping people here will want to get involved in anti-crime street patrols. Within the first hour after starting the recruitment drive, several people had stopped by to fill out the forms. I kind of figure, like, if the police, the police officers can't handle it all, then maybe they can do something about it. And I feel that if I can be a part of it, I can help too. What I feel is though, uh, if trouble starts, and they see me and know I'm a, what I'm about as being an angel. Maybe I can stop it before it really starts. The angels say their recruits must be employed or in school, and they say the first 50 cannot have any record of serious crime. This afternoon, Baltimore City Police met with the angels to figure out how they can cooperate with that kind of information. In any way that we could work with them in order to make their venture here in Baltimore a success, 
we would do it. The Angels recruiting drive will go on through Sunday. After screening and training, they hope to have a working chapter in Baltimore by October. Francis Harden on the scene at City Hall. June 14th, the 1500 block of Frederick Road. This is the morning after the heavy rain shredded the macadam here as if it were paper. The force of the rushing water also injured several people and one young girl drowned. That kind of flooding happens here every time there's a severe storm. And this is the 5100 block of Frederick Road today. Workmen are still trying to repair the damage caused by that storm. And because they're working, access roads to a small community here are entirely blocked. The only way in and out is a small alley, and people living here are worried about what's going to happen if that alley is blocked, say by a parked car. All we have is a little alley behind the 5100 block to get in and out of here. And the same way that fire apparatus would have to come in here if they had to. What are your worries about this alley as the only means of getting in and getting out of the neighborhood? Well, it's, it's an if, in event that the alley is blocked, then we have no way of getting in and out. And we've asked for uh, no parking signs to be put in the alley because people park in the alley. They wash their cars. They work on their cars. And the other day we had a, a tar pot there, uh, and they were torn a man's roof. Mm -hmm. So then you don't get in and don't get out. Creston Mills says access to the alley is one pressing problem the city could help with, but that doesn't solve the problem of what happens if it rains hard. This time that the young lady drowned out here on Chedworth and Frederick Road, uh, we figured probably something would be done about the conditions. Some people have moved away. I don't want to move away. I don't want to stay here. I hope that they can fix it up. The people at the City Department of Transit and Traffic told me they hadn't heard about this problem until we called them. But they say now that they know about it, they'll be checking and trying to make sure that this alleyway remains free and people here can get around. And we'll be checking to make sure the people living in this area don't run into any more roadblocks. This is Mary Norton on the scene of the 5100 block of Frederick Road. The first thing you should know about buying a television set is that like buying a car, the price is sometimes negotiable. For example, last week at Bernie and Harry's, a salesman immediately dropped $40 off the price of a 1982 19-inch RCA TV after we said the posted price was more than we were willing to spend. A similar incident happened at Luskin's. In order to interest us in a 19-inch color TV by Toshiba, three different salesmen at three different Luskin's offered to drop $20 off the posted price. Luskin's spokesman, Arnold Snyder, told us salesmen were only allowed to drop the price in certain circumstances. Only if the salesman or manager knows that a sale is going on in a couple days because this guarantee also says that anything purchased at Luskin's, if we do run it on sale within seven days, we will give you a refund of the difference. It's a possibility that just sale on the next day or in a couple days, and he has notification of this, and in turn, he will reduce the price to the sale price, which could be 20 or $30 lower. Despite what Mr. Snyder said, one salesman told us that Toshiba only goes on sale at Luskin's at certain times of the year and has not been put at a sale price since the last time we shopped there and were offered $20 off. You should also shop carefully for price. The same TV set at one Bernie and Harry's we shopped was $50 less than it was at another Bernie's and Harry's. Prices also change frequently. This 1981 RCA TV was $369 last Friday at Luskin's, Yesterday, it was $479. You will have difficulty comparing prices on some TVs. That's because stores carry different models and different model years. At Luskin's, almost all of the RCA TVs were 1981 models. At Bernie and Harry's, almost all were 1982 models. Todd Filderman, general manager of Bernie's and Harry's Baltimore stores, says that sometimes it's planned that way. When we buy, uh, we try to buy deep in a particular brand that we know is good and reliable. And if we can buy a number that we have exclusive, so we're by ourselves and we don't have to fight, you know, a lot of competition on it, we put a reasonable price on it, and that's it. Another selling tactic at Luskin's is for salesmen to refer customers to the January issue of Consumers Reports, which rates 19-inch color TVs. Salesmen will show you the reliability rating, which favors the Toshiba brand. They don't point out the overall rating, which actually gives the Toshiba lower marks than other TVs. An attorney for Consumers Union, which publishes Consumers Reports, says stores are not supposed to be using its magazine at all to try and sell their products.
Five years ago, 28-year-old Jacqueline Tolson applied for a job as an MTA bus driver. She was turned down. At 190 pounds, the MTA said she was overweight. My weight uh, doesn't hinder me in doing anything that I want to do. Matter of fact, now I jog and occasionally I lift weights. So uh, I don't see where my weight would play such a main factor as refusing me for a job, especially when I had met the requirements. Tolson's case and that of three other overweight women turned down by the MTA is the subject of an ongoing hearing involving the State Commission on Human Relations. Commission lawyers are arguing that the weight guidelines are unfair and that obesity should be considered a handicap and therefore not grounds for discrimination in employment. Because obesity causes, uh, because it is first of all an illness and second of all causes some incapacity, some difficulties with agility, and most important because it is treated as a disfigurement by the general public. That is precisely what makes it a handicap under the statute. At the time Jacqueline Tolson applied for the job, her weight was about 40 pounds above the MTA maximum for a woman of her height and build. The MTA is arguing that obesity is not an illness or a handicap, and that overweight persons do not make good employees because they have more medical problems and higher incidences of absenteeism. These people lack agility, lack mobility, and are not the most fit people that should be operating buses and subways. Lawyers involved with the case say it will probably be a year before the hearing examiner makes her ruling. But with appeals and other court action, they say, a final decision is still several years away. Joan Gartland, New Scene 2. Baltimore Beverage opened 14 months ago, but the small beer distributing company was not successful from the beginning. Baltimore Beverage couldn't compete in the marketplace. It was too competitive, the owner said, and they were losing a ton of money. The management went to the union in June and told the workers if they didn't take a pay cut, they would have to shut this place down. The union basically stonewalled us and didn't believe what we were telling them, did not believe that we were in financial trouble. Owner Joseph Cowan says his bank sent him this letter explaining the company's line of credit would be withdrawn. Our bank pulled our line of credit for basically not meeting certain financial criteria. If you sell a building and rent it back to yourself, and you sell the trucks and rent them back to yourself, and you have a company that doesn't have any trucks or any building, just a couple of desks and some beer laying around the floor that you're going to sell tomorrow, the bank sure doesn't have a lot of collateral. Union President Hoffman says the union rejected a wage reduction, which they say was 50 percent. Cowan says it was 10 percent, plus a minor reduction in benefits. The union says Cowan is a union buster. Cowan says the union leaders never told workers what the real proposals were and were just trying to avoid having the same thing happen with their union in other local beer companies. Monday, two new non-union companies will take over the assets of Baltimore Beverage, distributing the same products. The union says they'll boycott those products. Michael Shockett, New Scene 2 in East Point. 31 North Howard Street, an antique silver shop in the process of being robbed. The only employee there sounded a silent alarm. Police were there within moments of the suspects entering the door. However, the first police there backed off. In the young man's tone, they believe this one would end violently. No chance if he stayed in the shop, the suspect took to the street in one of the most dramatic, tense moments this reporter has ever witnessed. The hostage with a shotgun to his head seemed almost lifeless as the suspect tried to get away with his bag of silver antiques. The police, with the hospital looming just across the street, could only follow. As soon as the pair disappeared from view, it was over. The suspect had stolen a car at gunpoint, but in trying to get away, literally had run into the quick response team that was following. He was ordered to get out of the car. He refused. Officer Albert Earhart repeated that order. The hostage ducked, and the officer fired a shotgun. The suspect was killed instantly with a wound to the head. The hostage, 26-year-old Patrick Dugan, was taken to the hospital right across the street from the shop where he had worked with only minor injuries. Kurt Anderson on the scene, North Howard Street.
Police started early this morning rounding up their suspects. Fifteen in all brought into the southeastern district city police headquarters. Seven others had already been indicted. Well, someone would either pay cash or offer property for sale for food stamps uh, with a rule of thumb of about 50% of the value of the food stamp. So they're either, uh, either receiving the food stamps for cash, paying undercover agents cash, or they're giving undercover agents property. And we've recovered literally thousands of dollars worth of property. This is how the food stamp scam would work. Let's say I'm the one who's trying to pull the scam in. You legally receive food stamps from the government. I would come to you and offer you a deal. If, for instance, you had $100 of food stamps, I might come to you with a stolen television set and offer you a swap. Then I'll take those food stamps and illegally trade them for cash at a store. By the time the transaction is finished, I've paid out nothing but come away with $100 in cash. In addition to that, many of those arrested today owned their own stores that accepted food stamps. So police say it was easy for those suspects to take the illegally obtained food stamps and trade them in for cash. All 15 suspects appeared in court today. Food stamp fraud is a federal offense that carries a maximum of five years in prison. Today, a magistrate set bail for many at $10,000. How widespread is the problem of illegal dealing in food stamps? Joyce Jefferson looked into it. Hey, so? Well, someone would either pay cash or offer property for sale for food stamps uh, with a rule of thumb of about 50% of the value of the food stamp. So they're either either receiving the food stamps for cash, paying undercover agents cash, or they're giving undercover agents property. And we've recovered literally thousands of dollars worth of property. Just, I'm coming back from vacation. All Food stamps. Legally, they can only be used to buy food, but on the street, they're almost as good as cash. Margaret Bailey depends on $160 worth of food stamps to feed her family, and she says she sees a lot of trading on the black market. The going rate usually is like half price, or seven for ten, and people will approach you to buy food stamps or to sell food stamps. They can take place anywhere, you know, anywhere. The market is everywhere, in the store, on the street in the food stamp office. You know, the, the transactions are being made anywhere, but you just don't go out in the open and do it right out in the open on the corner. You go where it's more private and do it. Food stamps have become an important part of our economy. In the last year, Marylanders received about $170 million worth of food stamps. Uh, therefore, they do become Maryland uh, and the United States' second currency. Uh, right after the dollar bills comes food stamps. They are a negotiable instrument that can be used by anybody. You or I could use them if we had possession of them. Though sometimes food stamps are illegally used for non-food items, Mrs. Bailey says the market for food stamps exists because people need more than they're getting to survive. Most people I know would rather buy them. They're not selling theirs. They're keeping what they got and trying to buy something for somebody. People that don't have children that don't want to use the food stamps for food, rather have the cash, so they'll sell their stamps for the people that got children and need the extra food stamps. Mrs. Bailey says the black market for food stamps would probably dry up if only the government would provide enough food stamps to feed a family for the whole month. Joyce Jefferson, News Scene 2. This is a WMAR-TV editorial. Here is Vice President and General Manager Arnold J. Kleiner. The current public dialogue between Mayor Schaefer and Glenn Dowdy regarding the future of the Shake and Bake Family Fund Center is becoming increasingly bitter. This unfortunate turn of events is not in the interest of the city, Mr. Dowdy, nor the community the center is designed to serve. By now, of course, it's well known that Mr. Dowdy built this complex, which houses a bowling alley, skating rink, and other food and entertainment concessions with a $4 million loan he obtained from city trustees with the blessings of the mayor. It's also a matter of public knowledge that the former football star has failed to keep his end of the bargain to make monthly payments on the loan. While we agree with the mayor that the loan be repaid, there is some evidence that Mr. Dowdy's failure is not due to willful neglect. 
The center is an asset to the community, and some business and religious leaders are willing to try and help make it succeed because of its importance to the surrounding area. We believe that a little more time, more quiet, non-public discussions, in the same spirit of goodwill and joint cooperation which helped create the center in the first place, offer more promise than political rhetoric or bitterness.